Reverend John Ferret, I wish you shalom. And uh, just to let you know, we're in the continuing series called The Gospel According to Moses on the book of Exodus. And we've hit Exodus chapter 20 and the 10 words of God, Exodus 20 verses 1 through 17. And we're on episode 14 in that lesson 47 as we continue our intense study of what we call the Ten Commandments. So we're on the seventh commandment, Exodus 20, verse 14, and it's very interesting because it's just two Hebrew words. Lo tanaf. Lo tanaf. We would say, thou shalt not commit adultery, and in the Hebrew it just says, no adultery. Now, most people would say that adultery is sex between a married woman and a married man. That's how it's looked upon today. In the ancient Near East, back in the days of the Exodus, there was kind of a split. Probably in the ancient Near East, most of the pagan nations would say adultery is sex with a married woman only. In Egypt, it was both sex with a married man or sex with a married woman. That's it. In other words, it had nothing to do in the ancient Near East with any other type of sexual behavior. So adultery is somebody, a man, a married man or a single man, having sex with a married woman, the woman, not his wife. And in Egypt, as I said, it'd be sex with a married woman, whether her partner, her male partner was uh, married or not, it makes no difference, or it was a sex with a married man. Therefore, it's a single woman or a married woman, and if married, that's not her husband. Now, the church has gone way beyond this in many cases. I'll give you an example. I have John Kareed's Torah commentary with me. So it's a Christian Torah commentary, and he is, again, recognized as an awesome biblical scholar. He's an Egyptologist and archaeologist. However, he is typical in the sense that there is more that Christians or the church uh, really associates with this commandment the commandment is just, like I said, two words, lo tenaf, no adultery. In his Torah commentary, he says that this commandment is not only designed to condemn adultery, but judges all forms of sexual impurity. It is the exemplar or paradigm that is a standard to be applied to all types of sexual relationships. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible doesn't say that. This is Kareed's view. He's looking at Exodus 20, verse 14, and he's saying it relates to all sexual sin. Now, um, I disagree with this. I, I'm beginning to wonder if this comes from things that I have heard in the church, whereby the law, the old law, the laws in the Old Testament we can do away with, but the problem is the Ten Commandments. What do we do with that? Do we throw out everything? Well, the church says, no, no, we'll, we'll keep the Ten Commandments. And so therefore, if that's all they're going to do, and they would say there are other forms of sexual sin, could it be perhaps that what the church has done is because they have dismissed all the other laws in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, that they take a look at this one commandment in the Ten Commandments and associate all sexual sin with that. I, I, I would tend to agree. Problem is, it dismisses our Jewish roots. And on top of that, it really violates our study of the Bible as we put it into its historical perspective. So, for me, in my studies and research for this podcast, I have found 
that this commandment, the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, is more complex that I imagine it's not as simple as just saying, oh, this means all sexual sin, as the church portrays. So when we put it in its historical context, we're not just dealing with sexual sin. Now, in the 15th century BC, as I've mentioned, all pagan cultures, they considered adultery to be a great sin. Matter of fact, that are, those are the exact words that are used. We'll see this in another reference here shortly. And like I said, most pagan nations in the ancient Near East said adultery was sex with a married woman. So her partner would be an unmarried man or a married man who's not married to her. But the issue here is it's a great sin. Now, this is even true in Abraham's day. So this, is, this is Abraham's day is hundreds of years before the time of the Exodus in the 15th century BC. Do you remember the pagan king, Abimelech? Some of you may pronounce it Abimelech. Abimelech. This is back and going to be in Genesis chapter 20. If you recall, Abraham feared the king. He feared that uh, he would be killed because um, it seems to be a practice in those days in the pagan cultures that the king had such power that he could just take the woman that he wanted and to make sure that everything was, you might say, agreeable, they would kill the husband. So Abraham was a f f feared for his life and basically told Sarah, listen, they're going to take you but tell them a lie. Tell them I'm your brother. Now, there's more here. Uh, we're not going to go into it. I suggest that you go to the website, www.lightofmenorah.org. And when you're there, look at the top part of the home page, and you'll see a bunch of words up there. And the one that you should pick is Other Resources. Once you're in Other Resources, choose Podcast Playlists. And then once you've done that, all the playlists for everything that I've done since March of 2020 are there, all the playlists. And choose Genesis, the Gospel according to Moses, Genesis, and find Lesson 42. And you can just click on it, and you'll be able to study that concept and study specifically those Bible verses in chapter 20 that had everything to do with Abraham telling Sarah to lie to Avimelech with regards to him being her husband. But what I'm interested specifically is one verse in that story, and this is Genesis 20, verse 9. And it says in the New American Standard, Then Avimelech called Avraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you, that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. So here in Abraham's day, we see that Abimelech, a pagan king, is basically saying to sleep with a married woman, which is adultery, is a great sin. And it's a great sin throughout the ancient Near East. So I go to the InterVarsity Press Bible Backgrounds a resource for the Old Testament. And they have commentary here because, again, the IVP, the InterVarsity Press Bible Backgrounds commentary on the Old Testament or the New Testament, we're dealing here with Bible history, archaeology, and with the ancient cultures. So here is the commentary from the Bible historians with regards to this idea of the great sin. In Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Canaan, Canaan, adultery was regularly referred to as the great sin and was considered extremely detrimental to society in that it was characteristic of anarchy. So the Hittite laws, the Middle Assyrian laws, the Code of Hammurabi, all contain legislation against adultery. And the issue is 
not the sex involved. But as they go on here, the protection of the integrity of the family unit was important because the family was the foundation of society. Compromise or collapse of the family meant compromise or collapse of society. Matter of fact, going into this more and finding other resources with regards to the ancient Near East and the marriage practices, divorce practices, and what was considered adultery in those days, a woman caught in adultery could actually be executed in those days. It's just like we're going to read later on in Leviticus, that a man and a woman caught in adultery, where adultery is defined as sex with the married woman, both the married woman and her lover will be killed by God's law. And here we find this to be one of the possibilities in the ancient Near East and pagan cultures. It was really kind of up to the husband at that time to decide what the punishment would be for his, for his wife who was caught in this act of adultery. So in the ancient Near East, this is a great sin. And adultery threatens the integrity of the family. This is very interesting. The woman had such an important role in that unity of the family. And that if she somehow is tempted and lured into a extramarital affair with a married man, that's not her husband, or a single man. It was not necessarily the sex that was the issue, but what it was doing to the family. Now, if you recall, we talked about the Ten Commandments having a certain organization. We did this in previous lessons. You can go to, uh, for instance, the website again, www.lightamenorah.org. And again, you'll find the various um, words and various options that you have at the top of the screen. On the far right, pick other resources. Then click on podcast playlists and find the playlist for the Ten Commandments. When you find that playlist, go down to Lesson 12, both Parts parts 1 and part, parts two, part 2. And it talks about the Ten Commandments and it talks about the organization of the Ten Commandments. So it is possible that the Ten Commandments, which were written on tablets of stone on the front and back, could have been arranged that the first four were on one side and the last six were on the opposite side, or it could have been the first five were on one side and the last five were on the opposite side. I will go with the fact that it's possible that commandments 6 through 10, that second group, would have been a group that would have been uh, organized by itself because all of those commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, we haven't got to that one yet, have everything to do with our fellow man, our society. Where commandments 1 through 5, the first group, have everything to do with our relationship with God. Honoring parents has everything to do with our relationship to God. Again, like I said, if you go to Lesson 12 and Parts 1 and Part 2, uh, finding them in the podcast playlist, you'll be able to study that more in depth. Now, Dennis Prager has some excellent insights into this commandment as it's related to the second group, the second group of commandments, commandments 6 through 10, that are related to our fellow man and that are related to society. This was in his audio series on the Torah that he finished. It took him 25 years to teach the Torah line by line, paragraph by paragraph. It's, it's an amazing series, and he did it not only for Jews, but he's done it for uh, Jews practicing Judaism, but he also has done it for Jew and Gentile practicing Christianity. So again, commandments number 6 and 10 are related to God's instruction as to what it means to have a good society.
So as I mentioned, Dennis Prager, over all of these years in his uh, audio series on the Torah, we take a look at commandments 6 through 10. Do not murder means protection of the person. And an emphasis on life. Do not commit adultery. Preserve the family. And the family is the foundation of a good society. And this is true in the ancient Near East among all the pagan nations. Going again to the InterVarsity Press Bible background on the Old Testament, we read, The purpose of the legislation against adultery was to protect the husband's name by assuring him that his children would be his own. The law does not ensure marital fidelity. Its focus is paternity, not sexual ethics. The comment that I make there is if indeed a woman, who is the one that can have children in a marriage, if she gives in and has an extramarital affair, what happens is this comes against the husband's name, it comes against his descendants, and, other, and this child that possibly could come out of this extramarital affair, this adulterous affair, would have no dad. So it, it just br brings chaos uh, into society. So the integrity of the family is protected rather than the integrity of the marriage. This is and this is a natural result in societies that practice polygamy. So we go to the commandment number eight, do not steal. And this is to protect a person's possessions. Then the next commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness. That's more of a legal term in court. In other words, to create the foundation in a good society of a justice system, a legal system, a system that does not show favoritism, but is equal to all, whether poor or rich, powerful or weak, a fair, just society and a just and a legal and a fair, just legal system. Then we come to the last commandment, do not covet. Now we're going to get there. The, most people say this means lusting. And it's got nothing to do with lust. We're going to see that the Hebrew word that's translated into the English as covet has got a lot more to do with illegal or you might say devious means, fraudulent means, to be able to get something that we want. So once again, I thank Dennis Prager, a brilliant Hebrew scholar and Torah scholar showing us that indeed God's instruction, his Torah, is to teach his Hebrews, his people coming out of Egypt, what is required for a good society. Now when you go to Isaiah 42.6, we find that God says in Isaiah 42.6 that Israel is a light to the nations. And then in 49.6, Isaiah 49.6, we read that, and God is saying, yeah, you're a light to the nations to bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. And so all of a sudden we see Israel has been picked so that they will be a light to all the nations, the entire world, to teach the truth of God's word and to bring God's instruction as to what it means to have a righteous society, a good society, a society of shalom. And it's all dependent upon God's laws and obeying God's laws. And they, they would have to live that out to show the world what it means. But for the Hebrews coming out of Egypt, it even gets more interesting. This commandment, as we put it back into its historical context, I'm going to take a look at that as they hear the completeness of God's word. They're the first ones to hear the Torah. And so again, for the Hebrews, it even becomes more serious and more interesting. So join me in part two of this mini-series on commandment number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. And until then, I wish you shalom.